Uh, my name is Elisa Obrist, and I'm one of the co-directors for AstroTune. So if this is your first time coming out, uh, we're a monthly event that you should run the first Thursday of the month. And uh, completely organized and graduate students at the University of Toronto, um, both in astronomy and astrophysics, and also we have people from the physics department and sometimes aerospace um, helping us out with this. So as a, an organization and event run by graduate students, we really value the feedback you give to us. Uh, you can give a feedback form on your way in, and you can fill those up. Uh, if you don't have a writing utensil, we have pencils up here that we'll put out after the talk is done. And to incentivize you to return the forms and help us out, you'll have cookies. You know, warm presents and then we put the good into the variety. Um, after the talk, we have telescopes, although the forecast is great. Um, so I don't think we'll be able to do any observing tonight, but we'll see if that changes. Um, morning, it probably won't. Okay, thank you very much, Elisa, and thank you very much to the Astro Tours and the Graduate or Astronomers Graduate Student Association for letting me participate in this. And so, like uh, Lisa mentioned, I'm a student studying aerospace engineering, and by that note, I am not an astronomer, so please take all of my astronomy tidbits with a grain of salt, maybe confirm with one of the, all of, one of the other volunteers. So uh, tonight I'd like to tell you a story. I want to tell you the story of our mission to explore Pluto, all the way from its napkins to the New Horizons mission. So in 1991, the United States Postal Service distributed a series of stamps. For all the stamps, each one had a picture of a planet in our solar system. When they got to Pluto, they could only print this. Pluto, not yet explored, with what can be described as a rather drab depiction of Pluto. So this was the scene in 1991, 40 years into the dawn of the space age, us exploring our solar system, and we hadn't been to Pluto. So a little bit of a road map of what our solar system, the layout, Right here around the sun, there's the rocky worlds, there's Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. A little bit outside of that in this second zone is Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune. And all the way out past that is Pluto. Now we've known about the inner planets since antiquity. We can look up, we can see them in the naked eye without telescopes. Uranus and Neptune were the first planets to be discovered with telescopes. We only discovered these in the 1800s. And Pluto was one of the first planets. Neptune, we had predicted its ability to be there, but Pluto was a bit different. The, in, sorry, excuse me. In space, there's a phrase we use, there's no gravity in space, but that's a terrible phrase. Gravity is the law in outer space. Everything tugs on everything else. And so every planet, not just the sun, every bit of mass pulls on everything else. And these orbits are determined by what's pulling on everything. And so we saw the orbit of Neptune in the early 1900s wasn't quite what it should be, wasn't quite the shape that we thought it was, if there was nothing out past where Neptune was. So we were looking for something. In the early 1900s, astronomers were searching out past Neptune for an object. And so we have this man to thank, Clyde Tombaugh. In the year 1930, 
Clyde Tombaugh, an American astronomer, farmer born, built his own first telescope, discovered the planet Pluto. And he did this, I apologize, uh, toilessly. <laughs> he toiled over a telescope night after night, and he would expose different parts of the sky. Now this image, I really don't expect you'll be able to see this. It took me a long time to see. But he would take photos of the same patch of sky night to night and he would try and see if anything moved in that picture. Now the background stars are too far away to change. They won't shift night to night. However, an object closer to us, like a planet, or in this case Pluto, which just is a tiny little dot that moved from left to right in these images, can be seen moving night to night. So here we were, 1930, the discovery of the first new planet. Some people are alive today that were around before Pluto was discovered. And so, naming new planet, please consider Pluto, suggested by small girl for this dark, gloomy planet. This was the telegraph that gave the idea for the name Pluto. And so, when we hear the name Pluto, we might conjure up images of Mickey Mouse's dog cute little puppy. But Pluto is the name for the Roman god of the gatekeeper of the underworld, which is a different sort of image, um, but one which I think is far more apt. So flash forward, the dawn of the space age. Moving through the 1950s and the 1960s, we entered space. We sent the first humans to the moon in 1969. The Mariner 10 spacecraft took this photograph of Mercury in 1974, and only a few months before had taken this photo of Venus on its way by. The first of the Viking expeditions to Mars captured this photo, the striking surface of Mars like we'd never seen, 1975. And then out deeper into our solar system, into that second zone. Voyager 1 in 1979 flew past Jupiter, and then followed up with Saturn just one year later. Its twin sister spacecraft, Voyager 2, flew past Uranus, and then just one year later, flew past Neptune in 1987. And that brings us back to Pluto. Not yet explored, just a few years after that Neptune encounter. So no one wanted to go to Pluto. It was a dark, gloomy world at the end of the solar system. The gas giants were interesting. They were dynamic. They were worlds we'd never seen before. Pluto is a rock. We don't need a billion dollar photograph of a rock. So and to give you a sense of how far out Pluto is, these four inner planets, as you can see, one AU there is the distance of Earth to the sun on average. So as you can see, Mars is fairly close to the sun with us. Jupiter is five times as far away. Saturn is 10, Uranus is 20, Neptune is 30, and Pluto is 40. <laughs> and so, no, this distance is a very taxing thing on a spacecraft. You can't just easily modify a design necessarily. So this is an extra cost and wasn't worth the investment. Enter this man, Alan Stern, Mr. Pluto, 1989. Alan Stern was a planetary si engineer turned planetary scientist, an American fighter pilot, and at one point wannabe astronaut. So he commandeered the space interests of the planetary science community. And he'd long time been advocating for a mission to Pluto. And all those Voyager missions, he'd been squashed. So in 1989, he sat down with a group of like-minded scientists, and they formed the Pluto Underground, a planetary scientist mafia that was going to work their way in a grassroots way to get a mission to Pluto. Their efforts started with this, Pluto 350 in 1991 a mission 350 kilogram satellite, which is fairly light for a spacecraft, or sorry, fairly light for a spacecraft that would fly out to Pluto, orbit it, and map the entire surface. This was canceled. Mariner Mark II, they proposed the next year, which was a modified version of those spacecraft that flew by Venus and Mercury. They thought we'd kit it out, we'd send it out to the edge of our solar system. 
This was canceled. Pluto flyby, they decided. Scrap orbiting the planet. We'll just fly right by it. Much cheaper from a design point of view. Much more accessible, a lot quicker to build. And they thought this was a surefire success. It was canceled in 1993. So at this point, you think they should give up, go home, quit. They would need a miracle at this point to get something to Pluto. And that's exactly what they got. Remember we mentioned that everything in space pulls on everything else, and they thought there was something else out past Neptune. Well, we found Pluto. But what we didn't find was what was past Pluto. Until the 1990s, continued observations yielded the Kuiper Belt. This yellow line is the orbit of Pluto, and all of those white dots you see are small, little worlds inside of asteroids, an entire circumferential ring in our solar system plane that is filled with worlds that we're all pulling on all these outer planets, making their, changing their orbit. It was named the Kuiper Belt. And Pluto just happened to be this odd, oversized emissary, this gatekeeper at the front of it. So even with that knowledge, spacecraft proposals continued. Pluto Express in 1994. Pluto Kuiper Express, a mission that would fly by and take a, take a photograph of also a Kuiper Belt object we'll hear again later on. This was canceled in 1995. Now at this point, the International Space Station was underway. NASA had a lot of high priorities. They had a space shuttle program, which was doing very well. But we did have this new zone of our solar system to explore. And so after six more years of fighting, Pluto New Horizons got some funding. <laughs> <laughs> There's way more, um, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, so, what they got was a bit of a shoestring. They had five years to build it. They had to launch in 2006, which was a very narrow window, window, and we'll get into that in a moment, why they had to launch by 2006. And it takes 2,500 people to build a spacecraft, to build a spacecraft and get it to where it needs to go. We had 2,500 people employed directly in the construction of the spacecraft and in the development of the rocket, the Atlas V rocket, which got it there. And it had a $700 million budget, which to the grad students in the room sounds outstanding. To the spacecraft engineers, that was a slap in the face. The Voyager spacecraft missions had five times that budget to go closer, to do easier missions. So Alan Stern and the team, 2,500 people, had a lot ahead of them. So these spacecraft, to give you a size scale, the gold part you can see is about the size of a grand piano. So it's human scale. And obviously the most striking feature you can see is that wonderful radio antenna dish to communicate back to Earth all the way at 40 times the distance to the sun, 3 billion kilometers away. And so these kind of end up being something like a Christmas tree. Every scientist wants something on board. They want every instrument to capture every little thing about Pluto. But only the best make the cut. So, unfortunately, I can't talk about all of these fun different instruments. Some of them were the solar wind around Pluto, something to monitor the solar wind, which here on Earth helps contribute to the aurora borealis and the aurora australis, um, and wanted to see if that effect occurred on Pluto. And the most, uh, I think one of the best instruments to talk about is the LORI camera here. And so, stood for Long Range Reconnaissance Imager, which we will see a lot of from this guy later on. And so, and it's had, had a twin cam or a similar camera called the Ralph, which was a color camera. This Lori Imager was a black and white camera, but it was basically 
fairly typical camera that just had a telescope on the end of it. So that when we flew past Pluto, at closest approach, this spacecraft was 8,000 8, miles above the surface, just over 12,000 kilometers. And so you can see it here built into the hull of the spacecraft. This white part is part of the telescopic lens. Here you see two engineers integrating that solar wind collector. Now, I'd just like to give a brief little shout out to the unsung hero of space exploration and the beginnings of what I like to excitedly call space infrastructure. The Deep Space Network is a collection of telescope or er, communication antenna installations around the world, uh, primarily three. And they help navigate all of the spacecraft we have out in the solar system right now, from New Horizons to the Parker Solar Probe, which just launched a month back and is on its way to the sun, the Juno spacecraft, which is, on its, which is orbiting around Jupiter right now, and the InSight lander, which is headed to Mars right now. So this is an exciting piece, this is an exciting installation. And I love this graphic because the three main installations are in Spain, Australia, and Goldstone National Park. You can tell it's an American image. They give two countries in a national park. Um, down in California. And so, how do we power this thing? So a brief little note here. When we send spacecraft, when we send satellites up, there's a lot of solar panel, and we can get a lot of energy from the sun here on Earth and in Earth orbit. The Juno spacecraft, which just arrived at Jupiter, had an amazing feat and was able to get to Jupiter five times the distance from the sun on solar power. We're going 40 times the distance. We can't use solar panels. Maybe one day we will, but not today. So we have to use this guy which is a, it's a great word. Oh, is my slide broken? It's a radioisotope thermal generator, uh, which I'll probably just say RTG from now on. And what it is, is it's a scaled down nuclear reactor. And so inside that is a bunch of small pellets of plutonium, named after the planet Pluto discovered only a few years after the discovery of Pluto. So basically, this lets off the, Pluto, the plutonium bits inside decay. And they give off an extraordinary amount of heat. Now here on Earth, we turn that heat, we put it in water, and we can generate steam to move a turbine. Can't do a lot of that on a tiny spacecraft. So what we do is we can take that heat and we can directly convert it into electricity. It's not the most efficient thing, but we can do it. So when you launch this thing, it has 400 watts of power. That is not enough to run your electric kettle in your kitchen. And at Pluto, because of the radioactive decay, it's down to almost half that. It's around 200 watts to run all of that Christmas tree setup, run every camera, every switch, every motor inside of it. And one thing, when we're building spacecraft, when engineers build spacecraft, they have to survive in outer space. But more importantly, they have to survive on Earth while we build them. And we want everything in space to be really light. It doesn't have to, if we, it's lighter, we can get it going faster, we can launch it easier. But it has to stand up on its own. This black RTG, which on the inside is 1,000 degrees Celsius, has to stick out and weighs about 100 pounds. Now at launch, when this thing goes up, under 10 Gs of force, that 100 pounds turns into 1,000. So we have to have this honking big connector to hold it in place, all for about two minutes of its 15-year lifespan, which is so great. So after years of testing, from 2001 to 2006, building, construction, going, Alan Stern, after the final test, gives the thumbs up. Good to go. So I love this picture. I love this picture. And so on board, we have to get it there. The Atlas V rocket. 
At the time of this development, we didn't have a spacecraft, we didn't have a rocket that could go fast enough to get us to Pluto. So the top stage of this rocket was an experimental thing. This had recently been developed. Not the thing you want to put your money on. So, just a quick note down here, these are the solid rocket boosters. These are what give most of the thrust getting up. So this is a bit of an exploded view of our rocket. How much of this is actually New Horizons? So down here we see these solid rocket boosters giving most of the thrust up into orbit. Of this liquid, um, liquid rocket fuel motor, which provides a considerable another amount. And all of these separate and break off, and these fairings come loose to reveal the tiny little New Horizons. Just the very end. And so, this is New Horizons being closed into those fairings at the very tip top of that rocket. Now, I love this picture. And it's not necessarily because of how cool it is going in the rocket. But this is the last picture we will ever have of New Horizons. It's not like the Empire State Building or the CN Tower. People will take photographs of those things until they come down. We're never going to see this again. And so it's kind of interesting that all of this work, five years of building this, we're never going to see it again. So. January 2006, liftoff from Cape Canaveral, New Horizons was headed to Pluto. When the astronauts went to the moon in the 1960s, it took them three days to get from the Earth to the moon. This rocket got New Horizons past the moon in a third of a day. So, first stop on the way to Pluto, was Jupiter, weirdly enough. So, remember I said we had that tight window. We had to launch by 2006. Now, this GIF here, if you look, the red dot there is Jupiter, and the magenta is New Horizons. So it had to fly past Jupiter to get a course correction. Now that saves on fuel, that saves on mass for the spacecraft, so that makes the whole thing cheaper if we can use nature to help give us a bit of a boost. So it swings around Jupiter, and in one of those weird little quirks of orbital mechanics, our spacecraft speeds up, and it takes a little bit of speed away from Jupiter. Not a lot, Jupiter is so much more incredibly massive, but we do draw a little bit of speed from Jupiter's orbit to send us flying. Now, several advantages of going to Jupiter first. Not just for the speed boost, but we get to take these gorgeous photos. Um, and imagine yourself going on a European trip. You're going to go to Europe. You've got this whole trip planned. And you want to show your friends. You want to take photos of everything. You want to see everything great. But no one's ever been to Europe. No one can tell you what to take photos of and you have no idea what you're going to be looking at. So how do you plan that trip? So what you do is you have to schedule every single photograph you're going to take, every single time you're going to turn on your cell phone, every single time you're going to turn on the radio ahead of time. Because you, at these distances, light travels very fast, but not fast enough. Even out at Pluto, it's almost an hour time lag between the Earth, a signal coming from the Earth, to Jupiter. So you can't immediately spin your spacecraft easily. Out at Pluto, it's four and a half hours for a signal to get there. So with our choreographed dance of every photograph we wanted, pre-programmed on board, arrived at Jupiter. Now I love this photograph. This is Io down in the bottom. I apologize, you might not be able to see it, but there's a tiny little red speck there. That's a volcano. That's a volcanic eruption on a moon somewhere in the deep dark of our solar system. Earth is not the only exciting place.
And so using that other telescope on board, the Lori Imager, that telescope connected to a camera, we got to take photos of the Galilean moons. The first things, one of the first things observed with Galileo's telescope, the first one, way back in the 1600s. So a refresher again of where we are. We're at Jupiter now, 5 AU, and we have to get out to 40. So in 2006, the spacecraft launched. In 2007, we rendezvoused with Jupiter. It would be for eight more years before we arrived at Pluto. That's eight years in the dark. That's eight years of engineers and staff and scientists moving on to new jobs, retiring, and eight years of new ones entering the workforce. So you have this wonderful kind of turnover of generations. You have people coming on board to work with a spacecraft they've never seen in real life. They only have napkins and doodles and reports of how it works. And so there's a whole slew of knowledge transfer that has to go on, which I think is an interesting part of space exploration. And a lot happens <laughs> in that many years. 2001, when the spacecraft began, 2007, got the iPhone. And it wouldn't be for eight more years. And so, not only do cell phones change, but our view of the solar system changes in that time, too. We got to use some fantastic tools at our disposal, and we kept looking at Pluto. We wanted to see what else was there. Is there anything else lurking in the darkness around Pluto so we could prepare ourselves? So, the crew at NASA and John Hopkins University used the Hubble Space Telescope to peer at Pluto and see what they could find. So now, fast forward. You've moved through those eight years. 2015. We got this photo from Pluto. Now this is all very close. I'm fortunately there's no scale here, but this is all a very small stellar neighbor planetary neighborhood here. Pluto was not alone. Pluto's system was actually six worlds spinning around each other. We knew about Charon before this image, but what we didn't know about were Hydra, Nix, and Gerberos the rest of the underworld crew. So, this photograph is an astronomer's dream and an engineering nightmare. So, when we see a system like that, that could mean there's a whole slew of other small pieces of debris floating out there. What other worlds didn't we capture in that photo? And so the engineers at NASA rightly were very afraid because any tiny rock like that, nothing bigger than a marble, when your spacecraft is moving at 14 kilometers per second, a nicely placed marble is going to rip through your spacecraft like a well-aimed artillery shell. So. 2015, 10 days away from this approach, 10 days away from Pluto. The spacecraft took its cameras and they thought, this is the best vantage point. We can now map out this rubble. We can see what other worlds are here that we couldn't capture with the Hubble Space Telescope. So on came the instruments and we lost the spacecraft. Three billion kilometers from Earth. 15 years and 10 days away and they lost the spacecraft. So, fortunately, it was not a piece of rubble. But when you have a nine hour time lag for a signal to go back and forth, that's a lot of waiting. So what it turned out to be was when we sent those commands to take those photos, that wasn't on our European trip plan. And due to an odd combination of unforeseen commands going to the spacecraft, the computers overloaded and went into their computer fetal position. <laughs> and 
basically, the spacecraft just says, stop, stop what we're doing. So in a normal mission, had this happened at Jupiter, it would have taken months. They would have patiently gone through a very slow command sequence to bring everything back online very gently. We had 10 days. <laughs> There's no time for this. So with 10 days, there was naturally panic at mission control. So if any of you have seen Apollo 13, my personal favorite movie, there's those scenes where engineers are waking up around the clock, sleeping on the floor. That's what it was like for 10 days. So there's a wonderful, I can't get any photographs of that because of course no one was taking photographs. <laughs> the intern probably that did that got fired, I'm sure. So fortuitously, crisis was averted, and spacecraft came back online, just in time to capture the approach pictures on the way to Pluto. The end of June, moving into the start of July, photo here on Canada Day, and just in time for American 4th of July fireworks, the planet Pluto. So, if you look at all of the wonderful concept art, concept art from Pluto, all of it pales easily in comparison to what we found there. So naturally, there was enormous celebrations here on Earth, cheering a mission 25 years. It's a very expensive NASA person, by the way. <laughs> He's very happy. And so 15 years in making this spacecraft, 25 years from the napkins, what did we see? So the first thing to note is we all thought Pluto, from that dark, gloomy world, planetary scientists thought it was too cold. The surface here is 200 degrees below zero. They thought there is nothing more boring than that. There won't be any interesting geologic activity. We've had to rewrite the textbooks of planetary science. So. We'll just take a zoom in here on some of the beautiful vistas that we captured, these weird landscapes that we didn't anticipate. Here we can see these odd, beautiful deserts, these fields of ice positioned, juxtaposed to mountains. We knew Jupiter contained a lot of nitrogen and methane. That's the, what everyone thought it was all made of. However, solid nitrogen collapses under its own weight. You can't build a mountain out of nitrogen. But here we are. There are mountains on Pluto. What they're made of, don't really know. And then a world that's billions of years old. If you think of the surface of the moon, it's covered in craters. We can see these beautiful craters down here, impacts from billions of years ago. But then just north in this photograph, it's perfectly flat. That is an old surface. That surface is millions of years old. That one is billions. There is resurfacing happening on Pluto. The mountains that we've discovered range, they're not small, they're not little hills. These are comparable easily to the Rocky Mountains of Western Canada and Western United States. Some of the, where there are craters, they're spectacular. These sort of beautiful perforations down into the ice or nitrogen or whatever is beneath Pluto's surface. All of downtown Toronto could fit comfortably in the base of that crater. And so, we also found these odd little specklings, interesting things out there. And so we see these solidified bits of methane here and there all around the planet. And quite excitedly, we also got some photographs of Charon. And I want you to notice Charon's north pole here in this photograph. It's the same stuff that's floating on Pluto. It's quite possibly, one theory is that it's coming off of Pluto and landing on its moon, Charon. Sort of this odd case of interplanetary po pollination. It's a theory at this point, but I like it. Um, 
And Charon was no less interesting than Pluto. We see these beautiful valleys and raised plateaus. These don't come about from boring old rocks smashing into each other or cratering on surfaces. These come from active geologic processes. These worlds are not as boring or as cold as we imagined. They are worth these $700 million photos. And we also got to take some beautiful photographs. This is a methane map. So this is a purple. The purple's added here to show where concentrations of notable, interesting chemicals are. And I like this image a lot because I, I got to meet Alan Stern just a couple months after this encounter uh, in the fall of 2015. And we didn't have any of these photos yet. So we had a few of them. A few had gotten their way back to Earth. But after the spacecraft is done taking those photos, it can't download them all straight back to Earth right away. It would take a lot of power. And way out there, we don't have a lot of that. We didn't have enough to run an electric kettle. So what it does is it boop, boop, sends them back bit by bit by bit, like draining an Olympic swimming pool through a twirly straw. And it took 16 months to get everything back. It's the best movie you've ever downloaded. <laughs> So, we're done at Pluto. It's a flyby. You can't go back. There's not enough fuel on board the spacecraft to turn it around and keep it in orbit. So it just has to keep going. So if any of you can picture the Earthrise photograph that was taken by the Apollo 8 spacecraft, that was the dawn of the space age. This is the Pluto sunset. Flying out past as we enter the third zone of our solar system. From launch in 2006, through the Jupiter system in 2007, an encounter at Pluto in 2015, and an encounter with a Kuiper Belt object slated for sometime in late 2019. Mark your calendars. So, this is an artist's conception of an encounter with Ultima Thule, the Hyperbelt object, we suppose, or we, that the New Horizons mission is on course to rendezvous with and fly past. And I guarantee you, whatever images come back are going to be a lot nicer <laughs> and a lot more interesting than this artist thought. So, we can complete the set from the beginning. Pluto, New Horizons, in 2015 the capstone of the exploration of our solar system. But there was one more thing that this spacecraft took with it that is really special, that none had done before. Clyde Tombaugh continued planetary science all through his life. He was an advocate for Pluto exploration all through those dark years where no one else wanted to go. Clyde Tombaugh passed away in 1997 before the development of New Horizons could begin. And so, this is a small piece of his ashes which were put in an urn on board New Horizons. And if you let me read the inscription, it says, Interred herein are remains of American Clyde W. Tombaugh, discoverer of Pluto in the solar system's third zone. Adele and Murren's boy, Patricia's husband, Annette, and Alden's father, Astronomer, teacher, punster, and friend. Clyde W. Tombaugh, 1906 to 1997. So, this was in a real sense the capstone of the exploration of our solar system. Pluto, its moons, and this part of our solar system are such mysteries that New Horizons will rewrite all of our textbooks. And it certainly has done that. So New Horizons wasn't named after a scientist, wasn't named after a Greek god. It was named for what will come after it. This, in real senses, is the end of one generation of our space explorations. We've done a first pass. We've seen every major body of our solar system close up. And now it's time for the next generation. 
the next generation of exploration and spacecraft, a generation which I hope some of the people in this room will help be a part of. Thank you very much. So again, my disclaimer, I'm not an astronomer. So the question was uh, that the dust on Charon, that methane collection, that interplanetary pollination, as I called it. So that was a, a theory that was proposed on the day we got that photograph back by a planetary scientist at a news conference. And uh, to your question, great questions, like why is it only in one spot and how does that work? Absolutely no idea. But they are, uh, one, one sort of reason why it could be only in one space is uh, those worlds are planetary or tidally locked, just like the moon is with Earth. We only always see one side of the moon. So a similar situation could be affecting that. A great question. Uh, we'll go around the room here. Yes. I think Pluto is oh. So I think there are other work plans in the solar system. So my question is, like, do they believe in the fact that they orbit on a different plane? And why is Pluto, why is it the subject of so much fascination? Like, there's other work planets, so they don't know if they were considered planets. Mm-hmm. They're the same. So why is Pluto the same? Okay, so the question was, why, why is Pluto so special? Why there are other dwarf planets we know about, and why does Pluto get all of the attention? And I, I think uh, the answer I can give, the best answer to that, is we've known about Pluto for the longest, far longer than a lot of those other dwarf planets were. And I think Pluto's sort of odd orbit, it's sort of out of the plane of the rest of the planets, uh, why I think that helped make it a bit easier to identify and to find. And so I think that's why we found it earlier, and why it garnered a bit more of a more appeal. You had a whole generation of people learning about it several generations before we learned about other dwarf planets. So, uh, yes? Yeah. Great question. So the question was, it was not bright enough for solar panels to work, so why could we get such great photographs? And so that is a phenomenal question. Let me think about it for a moment. Uh, So um, solar panels require uh, quite a bit more light than uh, your eyes can see so uh, to work very well. So uh, in a room like this, you and I can see each other. You can see the board. I can see the wall. Uh, a solar panel in here wouldn't be able to power your calculator, pocket calculator, if anyone still owns pocket calculators. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. So the antenna, as you showed in the antenna, mm-hmm. has kind of a triple nested design, low A, medium A, and then the high A. I guess what's the rationale between going to the three, which is the same to the gallery? 
Okay, great question. Uh, I see one of my colleagues in the back who actually designs antennas, and I would really like to defer to him, but he's, I'm not sure if he knows. Okay, sorry, yeah, the question was, uh, if some of you may not have been see, known what to look for, but in some of the, the antenna design, there was a few other little antennas nested within that big one. And so what those are is those are high gain signals, so a lot of power, uh, a smaller set of power, a little bit less, and then an even smaller channel. And I think that would come down to a lot of things, or um, some things like during that eight years in the dark, eight years when there was nothing needed to be done on the spacecraft, um, they may send small bits of signal, and you don't need the entire apparatus to be running. And if you, you could use it, but if you need to use it a lot, that increases the chance of it breaking, and we'll definitely need that installation out at the end of Pluto. So it makes more sense to use the smaller channel Channels when you don't need to use your big channel. I think that might be it. So, uh, yes? Hi. Uh, this is one of the very rapid developments of um, like space, like, like spacecraft specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, if we were launching it now, yep. uh, what would you think it would have been improved by the design? Would it have been made significantly, or would the design be like, good for what it accomplished? Great question. So the question was, uh, if we rebuilt this now, what would be different if we started the development in 2018 instead of in 2001? And so you can kind of see in those first earlier slides with the other planets, the old planets of Venus and Mercury, those photos were taken in the 1970s. Uh, those pictures very much look like cameras people had in the 80s. So that was top of the line photography, and it's about 10 years away from a consumer market. So uh, right now, the cameras that were on board in the New Horizons mission were probably not that much better than are in everyone's phone in this room. So obviously more sophisticated, more systems involved, but certainly better photography is the first thing I can think of. Um, and more memory. You could take, on your European trip, you could plan to take an order of magnitude more photographs. So those would be the big ones I can think of. Great question. That's a great question. <laughs> yeah, HD photographs might take far longer. Yeah. Yes? Um, two questions. One, we're going cameras, so I don't have any tape recorder. You do not you need to lay like, all the photos, it'll manage the photo set. Mm -hmm. So when they start to do horizons and so forth, did they specifically know how far they're going to be away from sort of the magnetic cluster, or did they allow an auto focus mechanism? Second question, you said some of the maps that you utilize in sort of post bi-initial uh, missile Pluto spacecraft, like drawn on the map, and then you like, made a fancy deal with NASA, or was it? It was supposed to be cute. Um, uh, and obviously, just uh, from initial designs. So obviously, those proposals are very sophisticated documents. They're about this tall, and they have every single equation you could think of that anyone would ever ask. So even those missions were quite a lot of undertaking to just get scrapped. Yeah. And your first question, the first question was, uh, when we, did they have autofocus on the cameras? How far do they know how to focus their camera? And so at closest approach, like I said, it's about uh, 8,000 miles above the surface. And the cameras are designed to, we, we can very well plot out how far away we'd be from Pluto's surface. And the mountains, let's say, like let's say there's a six, six mile high mountain. Out of 8,000 miles, that's not enough to put something necessarily out of focus, I think. So uh, my guess is they just used estimates from how far away they'd be from the surface, if you assumed Pluto was like a nice sphere. That's my answer. Max, yes, we'll just do one more question, but Max will still be here up front afterwards if you have more. Mm -hmm. So. Yes. Yeah, for 8,000 miles, uh, you said, right? Yes. So what type of camera will be the best HD camera? Um, so the question was, uh, what what is the best camera to use that they had? And so uh, I think the um, that Lori camera was their their best instrument they had for in terms of parsing small detail uh, resolution, like how far if you have two people standing in that photograph. Uh, you can tell it's two and not just one blob. So that was a, a very sophisticated camera. 
That's a great question. I don't actually know that number offhand. But a lot of the electronics, to give you a ballpark number, uh, how much power do these instruments take? So some of the computers just take a couple watts, like 2 watts or 3 watts out of that 400. And uh, it's things like the camera that chew up something on the order of, say, like 50 watts or something like that. So that's an incredible amount of so, Something like that. Certainly a huge mark increase. Great. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Oh, sorry.